Michael Axford had a desk in the same office with Britt Reed's secretary, Miss Case. He was sitting there at ease when Miss Case came in. Oh, hello, Casey. Axford, take your feet off that desk. Has Mr. Reed come in yet? No, I think it's likely he'll be down till late this afternoon sometime. He was going to the civic club for lunch. Uh, the one place you can't follow him. I'd live there if I were he. Uh, did you see the story about the prince? The prince? Yeah, an oriental guy of some sort. Named Prince Jarpour. Oh, Mr. Reed won't publish stories about faith like that. I don't blame him. It burns me up to think of all the society dames that paid money to talk to a lug like that. Hey, how did you know about that story? Why, you thought on your desk. Oh, snooping. Huh? Now, I'll have you know I don't snoop. I was laying there in plain sight, and I saw his picture with that fat towel wrapped around his head and looked to see what it was all about. That's all. Huh. Hey, I wonder what he looks like without that thing on his head. Well, I wouldn't know. Do you think he's bald? I don't know. Uh, maybe that's why he wears it. Michael, I want to ask you something. Huh? Hey, go ahead, youngster. Who is Jonathan Derrick? Derrick? Sovereign Snake, where'd you meet that guy? You know him? There ain't a cop or G-man in this part of the country that don't know him. Why? Well, who is he? Uh, no, let me think a minute. I want to get this straight. He's a ruthless blackmailer that's left a trail of ruined lives behind him wherever he went. Huh? Yeah, I, I read that somewhere. <laughs> All I know is that he has a record a mile long and that he caused some suicide. He should have been put behind the bars years ago, but there never is anyone that will testify against him. Where did you hear about Derek? Well, I'm surprised you didn't see this note on my desk. Mr. Reed wants information about him. Well, why didn't Britt ask me? I could have told him plenty. Was Derek in town? Yeah, he lives here. Someday, someone is going to pay him off with a bullet instead of with cash. Mark my words. You'll mark your desk if you don't take your feet off it. <laughs> no, I won't. That's why I got the glass top on it. <laughs> I wonder why Reed wants to lower down on Derek. Hello, everyone. Oh, Mr. Reed. I thought you were going to the Civic Club, Reed. A little later, Axford. Oh, Miss Case, have you anything to report on Jacques Plenty, Mr. Reed. I went to see that phony prince. Hey, Casey, you didn't tell me. Axford, must I tell you everything? Uh, go on, Miss Case. Did you find out anything? Yes, Mr. Reed. He's a fake, all right. I had an appointment with him this noon. The place is full of prominent women all waiting to see him. Well, just how is he operating this case? Well, he preaches self-expression, individuality. He urges women to develop their ego, to assert themselves, and to prepare their souls for greater things. Holy crow. <laughs> Go on. And women like Mrs. Henry Mason just love it. Mrs. Mason? Hey, her husband's a big shot. She believes what Jaffour tells her? Mr. Reed, he practically hypnotizes women like Mrs. Mason. Hmm. He gets them talking, and they tell him anything he wants to know. Not only about their own business, but about their husbands. He could make a lot of trouble. He's dangerous, Mr. Reed. He's, He's worse than a swoon cloner. Well, come into my office, Miss Case. I want you to tell me all you know about this fellow. He might bear investigating. While Rick Reed learned about Lenore Case's interview with Prince Jaffour... Jonathan Derrick sat in the office of Henry Mason. Please be brief, Mr. Derrick. I have a luncheon appointment at the Civic Club. I'll get right to the point, Mason. Certain blocks of real estate are being bought up outside the city. Indeed. Now, the owners have no idea who the real buyers of the land might be. If they knew that you and two other gentlemen were buying the land to resell to the city for an airport, the prices would go sky high. Where did you get such an idea? Oh, I'm certain of my facts. I'll give you two days to think it over. Decide how much you can afford to pay to salvage your plan. Um, granting that you're correct, what is your proposition? Well, you think it over for two days, and I'll do the same. Well, naturally, I can benefit financially by taking my information to the people from whom you'll buy the land. It would interest them to know that uh, you must have that land at any price. However, I'm going to give you the first opportunity to bid. The proposition you make suits me. I'll go no further. Derek, I'll pay you $1,000 cash right now. You'll tell me how you got your information. My dear Mr. Mason, <laughs> I must protect my sources of... $2,000. There's a leak in my office. I'm sorry. Just a moment. Yes? 
I have 3000 in cash in this office right now. It's yours if you tell me where you learned of this. All right, Mason. I'll buy it. Where's the cash? Right here. Who told you about my uh, plans? The Green Hornet. The Green Hornet? <laughs> Thanks for the 3000 Now I'll leave. So you can keep your appointment at the Civic Club. Derek came to you just before you left your office. Yes, Fred. Well, then you could hardly have known his intentions when you phoned and uh, asked me to meet you here at the club for luncheon. No. No, I didn't know about Derek at the time I called you. I wanted to meet you and tell you what Hendricks, Fletcher, and I were doing. Buying up the real estate? Yes. So, why did you want to let me in on your plan? Because I thought it wise to deal with you just as I did with your father when he ran the Daily Sentinel. Oh, I was always perfectly frank with him. He knew that I gave him the straight facts. The point is simply this. We, the three of us, are buying up land that is to be used for an airport. We're doing it simply because this city needs an airport. Needs it badly. That's very true. On several occasions, a site has been considered. In every other case, the owners of the property learned about it and the prices of the land went up. The cost of the land became prohibitive. Condemnation proceedings would be too long drawn out and costly. Sites under consideration had to be rejected. I see. In this case, we three thought we'd secure the land before any news of the site leaked out. In that way, we could make it available to the city at a price within reason. Then you three are motivated by civic interest? Precisely. Not by a desire to make a profit. <laughs> Did you say profit? The three of us are in the 80% tax bracket. How could we make a profit? No, I I wanted you to know what we were doing because I thought you might get distorted facts and publish something that would spoil everything. I appreciate your frankness, Mason. Have you uh, told anyone else? No. Then how did this fellow Derek learn that you were buying up that land? He says he got his information from the Green Hornet. What? It cost me $3,000 to learn that. And having learned it, I know nothing. The Green Hornet's been in headlines. Perhaps Derek named him just to get your 3000 I don't know. The fact is, Derek knew my plans. I'd give anything to know how he got them. Do you think Fletcher or Hendricks told anyone? No, those men are too smart. They spent a lifetime learning the importance of a silent tongue. Mason, did you uh, tell your wife what you were doing? Edith? Yes, I tell her everything. That... Oh, well, she wouldn't talk. Why, good heavens, she's known about my affairs for 30 years. She's never divulged a thing. She'd hardly start at this late date. Do you think you'll have to pay Derek off? I'll have to. As much as I hate to be the victim of extortion, I'll have to do it. You're not the first of Jonathan Derek's victims. And unless something is done, you'll not be the last. <laughs> Too bad someone can't fight that crook with sharp weapons. Sharp weapons? What do you mean? People who fight him have nothing but the law with which to fight. Oh. And against a man like Derek, the law doesn't have sharp enough teeth. In fact, uh, she uses the law as uh, protective armor. spent the rest of the day quietly gathering facts about Jonathan Derrick. Facts that could be used to fight the crook by the Green Hornet. That evening, he called his valet, Cato, to his bedroom. Tonight, we're going to check on a few facts, Cato, and see if my supposition is correct. Yes, Mr. Briggs. There's one way this man, Derrick, might have learned of Mason's activities. That is, through Jarpur. Well, you think they're acquainted? At least acquainted. You see, Cato... I'm the only one who knows that Derek lied to Mason when he said his information came from the Green Hornet. Yes, sir. I have the addresses of both Derek and Jarper. They live near each other. I'm going to try to find out if they're working together. You would want the black beauty tonight? Yes, Kato. A mask and gas weapon? Tonight, I also want a real weapon. I'm taking a 38 revolver. 
Stepping through a secret panel in the rear of the closet in his bedroom, Brett Reed and Cato went along a narrow passageway built within the walls of the apartment itself. This passageway led to an adjoining building which fronted on a dark side street. Though supposedly abandoned, this building served as the hiding place for the sleek, superpowered Black Beauty, streamlined car of the Green Hornet. Brett Reed pressed a button. The great car roared into life. A section of the wall in front raised automatically, then closed as the gleaming black beauty sped into the darkness. A clock in a steeple near Jonathan Derrick's home struck ten as the Green Hornet and Cato approached a rear window. Window is locked? I'll hold a second. Uh, yes, yeah, it seems to be. We try at the window? No. Give me that thin piece of steel. Oh, yes, sir. This is just a standard latch. I think I can force it. Uh, there. Unlocked. I'll open the window. Just a couple of inches. Yeah, that'll do. I just need room enough to get my hand and the gun inside. You have gun? Yes. Get ready to travel, Cato. Now, get to the car. That should start something. This is likely. Here we are. In with you. That's right over. I'll drive. Now where? Now we'll keep on the point here with Prince Jafour. at once. I'm sure he and Derek are partners. What if they are partners? 
that's the case, we can find a way to discredit Jarpur and get rid of Derek. Well, look. There he goes. Good. I'm going to follow him and hear what he and Derek say. Michael Axford, as usual, was in police headquarters with his friend, Sergeant Burke. When the phone rang, Burke started a routine call. Until he heard the voice at the other end identify himself. What's that name? You say you're Jonathan Derrick? Holy crow, that guy ain't got the nerve to save himself. What's that, Derrick? Him calling the cops. Murder, you? Be right there. Uh, what's that about murder? Come on, Axford. Joe, take the board. They gotta go. Uh, where are we going? Derrick's house. He says someone's trying to murder him. Axford came into the office in a high speed of excitement. Cassie! Joe Slammers! Oh, oh golly. there you go again. But I got news. It was last night. What was last night? That guy we talked about yesterday. Jonathan Derry. By golly, he got it. Oh, I read something about that. Did you learn anything new at police headquarters? Where's he? I gotta see him. He's in his office, and you don't have to see him. He's busy. Busy or not, he'll want to hear about Mason. Mason is with me. I know, but Mason, he's... Mason just got here, and they're in concert. And you keep out of there. Please. What's the matter? Please. Something about that guy, Derry. Do you know Mr. Mason, actually? It's glad I am to meet you, Mason. How do you do? I just came from cop's headquarters, Reed. And you know the cops had a mysterious phone call during the night? Yes. They heard Derek saying that he was about to be murdered. They rushed to his place, found signs of a struggle, a bullet hole in the wall, and no sign of Derek. Yeah. Lord. But that was all in the first edition. What have you to add? One of the squad cars saw the green harness car in that neighborhood last night about the time of the phone call. Yes? There was a guy named Lambert that was sort of a house man for Derek. And he says he saw the green heart is leaving the place. Indeed. So the green heart is being hunted for the murder. Well, what murder? Derek. Have they found the corpus to like time? Uh, oh, you mean the cadaver? No, they ain't. Not yet. Then how do they know there's a murder? The cadaver must have been done away with. That's the only way I can see it. What did it turn up, the chances are? Uh, should I write up a story about the green heart? Well, write one. And then let me check it. Now... Please close the door. Oh, golly, I forgot the door. And there's Casey listening to the whole thing. From the outside. Oh. All right. Oh, Lord. Brett, do you see where this puts me? Oh, well, not exactly, Mason. You didn't kill Derek, did you? Heavens no, but I'll be questioned if it's known that he came to me. I had no alibi for last night. I was home alone, but I can't prove it. I understand. But if the facts come out, I'll certainly be held. And that would ruin me. Why should the facts come out? Well, that's why I came to you. This this man my wife calls on, Jarpur. Yes? He called me on the phone. He said that I should see him today. He said he would be able to help me remain a free man. Oh, you can, eh? He must know of, of what happened last night. What time are you going to call on it? This evening. Well, what time? Oh, about nine o'clock. Well, let me know what he says. Great. Would you like to go with me? No, Mason. You go along. Let me know what happened. A few hours later, Axford's story about the Green Hornet was in the paper. Just the left street, that bad Green Hornet is live. Here you are, sir. Just the writer charged with Hornet with murder. Here you are, lady. Read all about it. Just the left street, that bad. Sentinel writer. By golly, that's me, Reed. Sentinel writer charges Harnett with murder. Axford, why don't you put the paper down and finish your dinner? You know, Reed, when I see something like this in print, I wonder how he could write so smooth. A few revisions were made in your story. Hey, Cato, who was it at the front door? A special messenger, Mr. Axford, with a letter for you. Yeah? Boy, golly, maybe I'm getting fat, man. <laughs> Might as well clear the table, Cato. Axford won't eat any more dinner. He's most unusual. Holy crow! What's the matter with you? Reed, this is from the Green Hornet. Look, it's got a seal on the bottom. The Green Hornet writing to you? It's on account of my name being on this article in the Sentinel. Does the Hornet object to your accusation? Yeah. He says he won't take the blame for what he don't do. He says my alley, allegations are all wrong. And that ain't all. No? He says for me to take some cops and go and see this guy called Prince Jarpur and to do it tonight. Axford, take me with you. Oh, really? You? Yes, why not? You're always telling about the adventures you have when you travel with Burke and the other policemen. Let me in on some of the fun. Oh, no, Reed. I might be getting mixed up with the green harness before the night is out. Oh, what of it? A criminal like that is dangerous. It wouldn't do for you to risk your neck. Nonsense. What risk would it be with you along? Can't you protect me from the 
The green hornet? Besides, you may not even see the hornet. You're going to call on Jarpur, aren't you? All right, Reed. I'll take you with me. But remember, if we see the hornet, you get out of the way. You keep out of things and let me go into action. In accordance with the request made by Jarpur, Henry Mason called at the House of Oriental Splendor and faced Jarpur across a small inlaid table. He was amazed at the coolness with which Prince Jarpur made an amazing suggestion. And it will be possible for you to avoid much trouble. I will see that the body is never found. Uh, let me get you straight, Jarpur. You say you saw in the stars that Derek was to be killed last night? Among other things, I, I am an astrologer. And Derek was one of my pupils. I cast his horoscope some time ago. It was in the stars that last night he would meet with violence. I went to his home, intending to warn him, but alas, I was too late. Why did you send for me? To help you, the husband of one of my pupils. But I didn't kill Jonathan Derrick. You admit you are the most of... But I tell you, I didn't think the stars that you will face trial and conviction, disgrace and ruin. The stars in hell, Saeed, but do not foretell. They tell that which is destined, but those who are forewarned can take steps to change their destiny. You said you would see that Derek's body was never found. There can be no more than charge without the courts. I suppose it will cost me plenty. Well, it be good, perhaps. But what are these when your life is at stake? Abdul, tell he who is without that. The fool is in consultation. I cannot... Don't mind the argument. We're here on business. With the law. This is in Bruce. Come on, Mason. The police. John Four. Well, you got a warrant to search your place for Derek's body. Please, don't touch them. I can't stop them, Mason. It's us for far. Stop it. Try and stop it. Turn yeah. that thing for me. Take your hands off me. Your poor ass bitch. Stop. Thanks, Mason. You're not just turning off. Look. He's no more Hindu than I am. He's got blonde hair. Let's see. 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 Let's see.